Well, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, my name is Rich, and I've been doing open source for a few years. Um, right around the time we started calling it that is when I started working on it. Um, and I've been at AWS for a couple years now, uh, where I work as a strategist. And that means that I talk to people around the organization about how to do open source well. Uh, one of the privileges I've had in my career is I've always worked places where people were as passionate about open source as I am. But now that I'm working for a mega corporation, I, I find myself spending a lot more time talking to managers and using terms like ROI. And uh, this has been, it's been a bit of a, a shift in my communication style. And so what I want to talk with you about today is how to speak to people above you in the management structure about why open source is important. And, uh, you know, why I think that you should care about this is that you like open source and you want to keep your jobs. And uh, your manager tends to care about slightly different things. And understanding that these two things are not in conflict with one another, you're not trying to lie to management. Most of the time, no, no, really. You're not trying to lie to management. But it's about learning the language that you want to speak so that it communicates in terms that they appreciate and believe in. Now, there's, there's a meta reason why I want you to care about this. And that is that over the last couple decades, as open source has become integral to every piece of software on the planet, uh, more and more companies start treating open source as something that they consume and complain about, something that they just uh, download and use, rather than something that they need to sustain or participate in. Now, the, the funny thing about this picture is I used it in a, in a slide in a presentation a couple weeks ago, and I realized looking out in the audience that a, a number of the people in the audience didn't know what that was a picture of. So. Um, if, if you don't know what that's a picture of, look around for somebody uh, with uh, more gray in their hair or maybe whose knees hurt and ask them what that's a picture of. But uh, this, this tends to be the way that a lot of companies consume open source, as though it is a shrink wrap thing that the only involvement I need to have with it is installing it and then moving on. So one of the things that uh, I would encourage you to do as you engage in this thought experiment, is think about what your motivations are in participating in open source, and compare and contrast with what your company's motivations are. Um, so, you know, wh why, why do you do open source? Anybody? So it's, you know, this is a combination of fun and it, it fulfills a need that I have and it's connected to a hobby that I have. This is a very common answer and it's why I got involved in open source. Um, another reason, if y'all attended Spot's talk a while ago, it's to have fun and make friends. Um, it's, it's about sharing a social experience with people. Um, a very common answer that people give is resume building, particularly when you're at events that have a younger audience, uh, events that have a lot of students, this is going to be their answer. It's building resume. It's, it's, uh, it's putting something on GitHub so that when I go apply for a job, um, people know what I've done. And you know, maybe because it's your job. There was a, a survey that was done uh, five or six years ago, and these were the answers that were given by most people uh, learning something new and creating career opportunities was at the top of the list. It's self-education. It's advancing my skills. Fun comes shortly after that. And then there's a whole category of, of altruism, doing something because it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. It's supporting the world. It's making the world a better place. Now, what I love about this event and others like it that I go to, is it's an opportunity to sit around the campfire and trade stories and, uh, uh, you know, maybe laugh at the people in management that don't get it and, uh, you know, tell, tell some of the dumpster fire stories, the situations that we had to deal with because people didn't get it. And this is not 
why your company does open source. Um, your company probably doesn't even mean the same thing that you do when you talk about doing open source. Um, when a company talks about open source, they're talking about reducing costs, uh, increasing profit margins, making things easier, uh, delivering product more quickly. And these are not the same motivations that individuals tend to cite when they talk about doing open source. So your, your manager, and, and I, I want to I give a brief disclaimer here. I'm not talking about my manager. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is my manager, and my manager is the president of the Apache Software Foundation. And so he gets it, right? He, he understands open source. He's been involved in open source for a long time. And the weird thing is, he's my boss at work, but at the Apache Software Foundation, I'm his boss because I'm on the board of directors. So we have this, this weird dual relationship depending on which hat we're wearing in a particular meeting. But uh, I'm sure that you have a wonderful manager because you're here. They let you come. They valued this to the point where they thought you should come. So maybe we're talking about their manager or the one above that. Um, and when you are talking to a manager, you have to speak their language. Now, I want to I emphasize, I said this earlier, this is about translation, not about lying. Um, open source is, above all, practical. It's an objectively better way to build software, and what's good for the customer just happens to also be the right thing to do. So these things are in alignment. They might not look that way, if you are approaching open source from a purely philosophical perspective. So don't lie to your manager because they'll eventually figure it out and then you'll have to go work somewhere else. So what's in it for the company? Well, it, it, would, be, it would be dismissive, it would be reductionist to say that it's only about profits, but that's certainly high on the list. Um, if you work for a good company, they probably care that customers are getting what they want. They, they care about the customers. Um, they probably care that the product, the service, the outcome that the company is producing makes them look good. They, they, want, they want quality. They want to produce a quality project, product. Um, a lot of companies care about their reputation and their legacy. They want to know that people look respectfully at their company. But the bottom line is going to be profit for most of the companies that we work for. So, how do you go about this? Well, I'm going to start with um, what not to do. So, uh, this is a great book, by the way. I recommend that you acquire this book and read it. It's a, it's a book of, of essays about how open source came into being. But, when you are talking with your manager, don't lead with philosophy. Don't lead with jargon or licenses or why free software is fundamentally better from, than open source software. Don't start with that because their eyes are going to glaze over and you're going to lose them right away. And particularly in the, first, <laughs> in the first conversation, maybe you're riding up in the elevator with them and you've only got just a minute to make a point. And if you, you, start, with, um, you, you start with a philosophical treatise, then you have lost your opportunity. Uh, one, of, one of my early open source memories is uh, going to a talk where Miguel de Ocasa and Richard Stallman were on stage debating the relative merits of free software and open source. And it was, it was intriguing. But the thing that stands out in my mind was Miguel saying uh, this very thing. If you only have a minute to make a, a point and you start delving into philosophy, then you have lost your opportunity and you've probably lost a sale in the process. So, you know, we, we talk in open source about how giving back is a moral obligation. Don't, don't lead with that. Your business is not a charity. Um, and Dawn, who's sitting over there, said in a talk that I attended a year or two ago, something that really stuck in my mind. If you talk about what you do in your job as though it's charity, you will be the first thing that's cut when the budget discussions happen. And uh, so, you know, don't, don't lead with that. Uh, if, if you feel like 
open source is a moral obligation or for the greater good, that doesn't sell really well to shareholders. So instead, what you should talk about is the supply chain. You should talk about how open source is the thing that your company is building its value on top of. Um, why is giving back the right thing to do? Well, it's not because it gives us a warm feeling in our heart. It's because if we don't do it, then that project won't be around next year and our business is going to tank. Um, it, it's not because of a moral obligation. It's, it's in order to sustain this thing that is part of our product. Uh, and so, you know, your, your manager read a book last month on S-bombs and the supply chain, and they're looking for an opportunity to bring this up in conversation. This is a great way to say, this is one of the pieces that we build our product out of. If your project, if your company is betting millions of dollars on a product, then they better make sure that all the bits that go into that product are still available next month. So uh, another thing that, that's a good thing to do is don't be afraid to tell supply chain horror stories. Now, these, these three logos here were marketing genius. The fact that a software bug has a logo is, is just, it's genius. It, uh, it made people aware of these things that would never have thought about it, and it became part of our international conversation. Now, that's led very directly to some very inconvenient laws that we all need to figure out now what they mean and how to apply them in our companies. But it also means that legislators are now paying attention to issues that before now were just of interest to a few geeks and not really part of, of political discussions, certainly. It's, it's also important to uh, be careful how you tell these stories. Um, when we first started telling the, the uh, log for shell story, what a lot of people heard was, right, open source is bad because it causes these sorts of problems. And uh, I, I feel like we've been able to turn that story around for the most part, but there are still some people that, that see it that way. This thing comes out of this weird community of, of hippies building software in their grandmother's basement, we really can't trust it. And so be careful how you tell these stories. Um, in each of these cases, and indeed in the log for shell case, the story is that these things were solved quickly and thoroughly because they were open source. Whereas if they had, become, if they had been part of a proprietary product, that process would have been more transparent and less trustworthy. Now every, Every presentation at this conference has used this slide, so I feel like I have to as well. Um, and and you know, the, the thing that you want to communicate here is that your company is one of those things teetering on the top. And this is not just a be afraid slide, it's what can I do to fix that thing at the bottom? What can I do to trowel in something there at the bottom to make sure that it doesn't fall over? And that is, being engaged in these projects. The next thing I would encourage you to do is use data. I'm not asking you to read this slide. The point of this slide is you want to use specific data points that illustrate the, the cost of failure. Um, if this project that is maintained by two people suddenly were to go away, here's what it would cost us to rebuild that from scratch or to go on maintaining it ourselves. We'd have to hire six more people or we would have to uh, build something from scratch to fill this gap. And this is the kind of information that, that your manager needs because they're actually building a budget and they have to sell their budget to their manager and get approval. And uh, wow, I am, uh, yeah, I think I've still got time. Um, so you also want to talk about sustainability and whether a project is sustainable is an entire other talk um, and I've attended at least one this week. But uh, you, know, you want to look to see whether a project is supported by multiple vendors or if it's just a single developer project that's on GitHub somewhere. Um, and you, know, you might run into this situation where you are betting your entire business on a project 
that is de developed by a single developer in a country that suddenly goes to war, and now your product is threatened by all manner of things that you never considered in your business plan. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, got a little bit. Uh, this, this graph is uh, one of the, the terms that, that we use in, in analytics. I've heard it mentioned in a number of talks. This is the elephant factor. How many companies are involved in projects that you care about? So this is a, a project that uh, I've obscured a little bit, um, and each one of those color blocks indicates a particular company that's involved in producing this, this software. So if my company has a... a uh, a bad relationship with the company in dark blue, how's that going to look for me when they realize that I'm basing my business on top of this? Are they going to go change their license? Um, is there a way that I can fix this situation by getting more involved in the project? Or maybe, maybe I should pick a different project entirely. Um, this is uh, analysis that you need to do before you get engaged in an open source project. Another great risk is, is single maintainer projects. This is what I think is a, a, a pretty uh, healthy project, but uh, those pink bars there, what happens if that guy, whoever it is, that's indicated, I don't see him in this room, so I can talk about him. Um, so the, the pink there represents Yarek Pachuk, who's maintaining the other room there, and, and he, is the, he produces 50% of the code in Apache Airflow. So if, if Yarek wins the, uh, the lottery, how is that going to affect your business? These are things to consider. All right. The next thing that, that uh, people talk about in getting involved in open source is to build their reputation, to build their resume. Popularity is kind of the thing that we're talking about here. We all like being popular. These are my two oldest beautiful children. And uh, when they were in high school, they were very concerned with being popular. And as you can tell, they're incredibly good looking, and so they were very popular. Um, but your company is not interested in you being popular. Um, they want you to be successful. They, they don't mind if you're popular. Um, but maybe popularity is a proxy for influence in a project. So here's my other kid. Uh, they don't care about being popular. Um, they care about uh, setting the conversation. They want to be the one that, that leads the conversation. And they want to be the driver. And this is what you want to be, and this is what you want to communicate to your management about your involvement in open source projects. That you have influence, um, and that, that you are a leader of people, and that the things that you do are beneficial to the project, and to the company, and to your customers. Don't claim that you lead or own or invented the project. Don't claim that it's all you, because that's not, what, that's not the reality of open source. Um, but, but try to gain influence in the project by participating meaningfully and communicate that to your management. Um, adoption of open source projects may benefit your, your competitors. And you need to be able to communicate that lifting all the boats by improving an open source project drives adoption of the technology, which in turn increases the size of the pie. This is not, it's not a limited resource. If you can increase the total adoption of an open source project, then yeah, you'll benefit your, your, your uh, competitors, but you'll increase the total market share that's available to everyone. All right, uh, another thing that people talk about in open source is how fun it is. This is a, a conference that I went to in Nairobi uh, a couple years ago, and it was a huge amount of fun, and I made a lot of new friends, and uh, just, had a, just had a fantastic time. Um, open source is an endless party, and it's a source of, of lots of friends. I have lots of friends in this room that I met through open source. Your company does not care whether you have fun despite what they said in the recruiting ads. So um, talk instead about recruitment. If your company is a fun place to work, 
um, then you are going to tell people in the industry that it's a fun place to work, either by your words or just by them observing how much fun you're having. And this is great for recruitment. Um, and, you know, by the way, I work with some of the best people in the world, and I have lots of fun in my job. And uh, you, uh, the, the thing that you want to be careful about here is promising people something that you can't deliver on. So if you promise somebody that if you come work on my team, you'll be working on open source 100% of the time, and then you can't deliver on that promise, they're going to tell their friends, and then you know, you've, you've jettisoned that, all the benefit that was associated with that. But uh, Oh, and also you should be aware that open source people have lots of opinions, and they can be difficult to manage. So, you know. <laughs> And, you know, resume building is another thing that people mention as a, a real motivation for getting involved in open source. Your manager is especially not interested in you building your resume, um, unless they're trying to get rid of you. So if they encourage you to go to a lot of training, you know, be, be warned. But uh, instead, talk about open source as ongoing education. It's a way to educate yourself about technology and uh, code or skills that you simply wouldn't have access to that inexpensively if you were to go to paid training. Now, I, I want to be very careful about using the word free. This is a free kitten that my daughter gave me. And uh, those of you that have cats know that, that uh, free as in kittens means very expensive. Open source is not free. Your costs just go somewhere else. So do be careful when you're speaking with management about open source to be very uh, to, to not use the word free too freely. Um, talk instead about customer value. Uh, my wife is a is a jeweler, and this is one of the pieces that she made. Open source allows the customer to participate in the crafting process in ways that proprietary software doesn't. They can see it being made. They can participate with you in the making and their voice is heard at all levels of the decision process if they choose to make it heard, because they can participate as well. Um, participation in open source also establishes expertise, both in terms of actually building your own expertise, but also telling the world that you're an expert. You know, we can, we can say in our marketing that we're experts in a particular technology, but what speaks louder is when engineers on your team are involved in those projects and the world can see them doing that work in public. All right, I am out of time. Um, there's so many other things that we could talk about, these conversations that you might have with people uh, in your management. Can't we just fork it? Can't we just write our own thing from scratch? Can't we just throw money at it? And none of these are a substitute for actually being involved in the projects, but there's some benefit to some of these things if, if, uh, if approached carefully. Um, the, the last thought that I want to leave you with is that open source is a long-term investment. Um, the things that you do in open source today will not bear fruit tomorrow. It's going to take years of work to obtain maintainer status on the project that you care about to build your reputation in a project, to make up for the way that your predecessor burned reputation in a project. These are all things that take a long, long time, and most companies think about the next quarter's profits. Uh, it's very hard to get management to be patient. And so I, I don't have easy answers for this other than pointing at existing case studies in in software where you can see things building over time, but it takes a long time to get to that point. Um, so I am completely out of time, but I think I might have a minute or two for questions. No, this is, this is totally fine. You've got five minutes left, so oh, thanks okay. a lot for your, uh, for your insights. <laughs>
go into do an open source just because you want to build a career there and then simply abandon the project is not intentionally go into the project. You mentioned this as building profile. How do you see this position? So I, I think the question is about people building open source and then abandoning it purely to build their resume. Yeah, and uh, this is one of the reasons to avoid single developer projects if you're building a company on top of something. Um, motivations around open source are, are complicated. Um, and, you know, when, when you're evaluating the potential longevity of a project, you have to take a lot more into account than can I download it and run it. Um, and, uh, no, there's, there's, there's no easy answer to determining if that's the case. But, yeah, I, I've certainly seen that happen. Um, and uh, a, a few weeks ago, I attended ChaosCon at uh, FOSDEM and you know, had my eyes open to a whole other class of contributors, which is people that contribute to open source as part of academia. I did this because it was my homework. And we have a tendency in open source to just dismiss those people as not important to us. Um, and that would be, I think, a mistake. And understanding the motivations behind why people contribute, contribute to open source is, is certainly a whole science that... Uh, that I learned a lot about at that conference, so, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Um, did you at one point start discussing philosophy with your managers? Um, that may have happened once or twice. Um, and you know, like I say, I've, I've had the luxury of working places where my management cared about open source. Um, but I've, I've had a few jobs, um, one of my one of my early software development jobs, um, I did in fact make that explicit mistake. I started discussing with my manager about why uh, why open source was important and why we should contribute back to the projects that we were benefiting from, and uh, he shut me down very quickly. Um, so yeah, it's something that that you learn once and you retain a long time <laughs> because it can be it can be humiliating. And it can be very frustrating because it sets your own message back a, a, a long way. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And yeah. uh, if I'll, I'll be around the rest of today and tomorrow if you have any other questions. Thanks a lot, Rich.